Alan, have you heard about what's going on over in Israel? I've been watching the news. All the missiles being fired back and forth, the bombings. So if you've been watching the news, I trust you've been hearing the reporters asking for Israel to take it easy on Hamas, maybe keep it in proportion. Sounds like a bunch of woke idiots. Yeah, more than likely. Because when you're at war, win or lose, you need to go all out. I agree. You got to be tough. Got to be strong. Can't be weak. And that's what we're going to be talking about this episode. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Dustin Bass. And I'm Alan Joaquin. And we are the Sons of History, and we've got an incredibly special guest on the show for this episode. Thanks totally, in part, to my good friend, Alan Joaquin. So, thank you very much for bringing him on board. Anytime. We've got Michael Walsh on the show this week. He's the author of 16 books, and two of them are New York Times bestsellers, and one of them actually won the 2004 American Book Award for fiction. That book is called And All the Saints. He also, Disney. Yeah, he did the uh, Cadet Kelly, which was the most successful uh, Disney movie for, for quite some time. Um, he did that. He's also uh, with Time Magazine. Yep. He was there when the uh, when the Soviet Union fell. He was there when the Berlin Wall fell. Yeah, he was a so, classical music critic. Yeah, and so. uh, yeah, I, I read one of his books, um, The uh, Devil's Pleasure Palace, mm -hmm. and um, fantastic book. I highly recommend that one. Yeah. And I, when I read it, I was like, "Going, we've got to get this guy on our show." Yeah. Now, so. before we get started to the show, uh, if you haven't yet. Um, Yours truly was interviewed by Joshua Phillip over at Crossroads with the Epoch Times. You can go check that out. It's on Epoch TV, and I think I did all right. So if you haven't watched that, make sure you go check it out after this episode. And without further ado, let's bring Michael Walsh on, shall we? That's... All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we've got Michael Walsh on the show. Michael, how are you doing, man? I'm good, thanks. Good to be with you guys. It is fantastic to have you. Alan, I know that uh, you were the one who reached out uh, to Michael. Yes. Uh, you had read one of his books, right? I read one of his books. Uh, it was endorsed by Dr. Mary Graybar, who mm -hmm. was a guest uh, on our show previously. And uh, because, you know, we were talking about the Frankfurt School and, uh, you know, the critical, critical theory. theory yeah. so, so I came across his book, endorsed, and because I wanted to read what was a good book on that. I didn't want some slant from a leftist. So as a, you know... Mary Graybar mentioned it, and I bought it, and uh, here we are. And here we are. We're here to talk about your latest book. came out in December of last year, correct? Uh, last Stands. Yeah, Last Stands. It sold out on day one on Amazon. So that kind of got everybody's attention very quickly. And uh, it's been selling very steadily ever since. And uh, I'll be writing a not a sequel, but a kind of companion volume to it. Uh, which will come out in 2023. <clears throat> and the title of that will be A Rage to Live, A Time to Die. So it'll be uh, Mo Better Last Stands in a way. In a way. <laughs> it'll, but it's, uh, my brother, who's a retired naval officer, uh, yelled at me and he said, you didn't put any naval battles in this book, you idiot. Now, I'm wearing my Camp Lejeune, North Carolina t-shirt, which is my birthplace on the Marine base right. of Camp Lejeune. So... You know, the Marines view the Navy as guys that give them a ride to wherever they're supposed to go kill people. And But in, in honor of my my bro, I've decided to include some naval battles in, in uh, Rage to Live as well. So that's a little taste of, of what's coming. Fantastic. Uh, now, I know that there is, and we're going to get to it, there's a tie since you brought up your, your upcoming book uh, that you'll be putting out. Uh, and it has to do with naval battles. Are you going to tie in? Because there is a Korean tie-in with you. Um but are you going to pull in any uh, Korean, old Korean battles? Because I think there was an old Korean, or a movie of an old Korean battle. Where it's a big naval battle that stops uh, Japan uh, from coming uh, sort of down the Korean Strait. Well, I'm, I'm not going to do that one. Uh, I, I didn't do many Asian battle, any Asian battles in the first book. I'm planning to do, uh, if it all comes together, and you never know until you start writing, you know, as Mike Tyson says, everybody has a plan until he gets hit in the mouth. So <laughs> once, once you start, books kind of take on a life of their own. But I'm hoping to uh, 
cover uh, Shiroyama, which is the last stand of the samurai, which is, was made into a movie with Tom Cruise called The Last Samurai. Uh, that's an epical, epic and epical battle in Japanese history. And then Saragahi, which is a battle in which a very small handful of Sikh warriors in the British Indian Army held off uh, an enormous force of Afghan tribesmen up in the Khyber Pass. They all got killed, but they took a heck of a lot of guys with them. Uh, those two battles have interested me for a long time. And so if there's room uh, in the second book, I, I'm going to try to include them as well. But the second book will will start again with the ancient world. It'll start with Alexander. Uh, I want to do Gaugamela uh, or Gaugamela, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, which is the pivotal defeat of the Persians uh, by Alexander the Great. I want to do Actium, which is a naval battle in which Mark Antony and Cleopatra lose to uh, Octavian, later Augustus Caesar. Uh, I want to do a lot about the Middle Ages, so there'll be something about the First Crusade in it. Uh, then, of course, the 19th century is dominated by Napoleon, so there'll be uh, quite a bit of uh, Napoleon uh, material in that section. And then the 20th century, uh, a couple of World War II battles, especially Lady Gulf, with with the destroyed the Japanese fleet basically, uh, and Saipan um, will be part of it. So that's kind of a foretaste of, of where we're going. The late the Leyte Gulf was the one I was I was thinking about when you mentioned the um, the naval battles because I know there was like a, a light carrier that went after a um, one of the Japanese fleets and they had no chance whatsoever. But, but no, they uh, just raised that ship. I forget. I think it's called the Sullivan. I'm I'm not sure what it's called. <clears throat> off the top of my head, but he went down fighting and and uh, really did some damage before they sank that ship. So, you know, war is not uh, it's not a video game. That's that's one of the points I try to make here. Well, yeah, you, you mentioned the uh, the last samurai. Now, there was an interview that you did where you mentioned I think it was I think it's pronounced the Battle of Kanai, where Hannibal defeated the Romans, and you said that. Can I? Okay. And one one of the soldiers had um, a nose and an ear in his mouth. And, yeah. and you said how they don't quit. And I remembered that scene from The Last Samurai where when Tom Cruise was captured, that he would not quit. And at the last second, he used all his strength to kill that one guy. And the commander just watched in amazement. And he's like, no, 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 spare his life. Yeah. So, and it's... It's, uh, it's a classic. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, so. I, I thought of that scene when you were when you were describing that. And now here you are, you're going to talk about it in your next book. Yeah, we're always thinking about Tom Cruise as much as what? we possibly can. <laughs> uh, now, your, your book that just came out, uh, we gave a quick rundown, but uh, sort of give us maybe a broader overview of what Last Stand is all about. It's about masculinity. Uh, and that's... <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's something that uh, guys, especially guys of your generation, need to learn about because you've been brought up in a feminized society. You've been taught that masculine instincts are evil. Uh, they should be suppressed, whether by drugs or what they've done to some of these kids is just disgraceful. Before we even get into the sex change operations on four year olds, uh, they've basically demonized masculinity and called it toxic. So I gave a uh, preview of the first chapter of the book, which is called To Die For, uh, at Hillsdale College, uh, what, a year and a half ago or so. <clears throat> and I called it In Praise of Toxic Masculinity, because I think toxic masculinity is, in fact, masculinity, period. There's no adjective that needs to be uh, a, a, appended to it. And that men fight, and that's really the point of the book. Um, this, there is a philosophical chapter that opens, as, as we know, uh, in which I quote Kant saying that war is the natural state of man and peace is the exception, which is demonstrably true. And we go from there into a historical survey of these great fights from Thermopylae, which is, of course, the original last stand, and all the way up to my father's experience in the Korean War, where he was at the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir. So I, I realized as I was writing, and I, this, I did not know this when I pitched the book, but as I was writing it, I suddenly thought, shows you what a genius I am. Hey, holy cow, I've got a member of my own family that was in a last stand. Maybe I ought to talk to him about it. So I went down to Florida. He's going to be 95 years old on uh, June 1st. So he and happy 95th birthday, Pop, and Marilyn Monroe, who was born on the same day. We always found that quite amusing when we were kids. Hey, Dad, why didn't you marry Marilyn? No, no. <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. 
Uh, and he was kind enough to spend hours with me talking through the battle, kind of drew position maps. And, and so we're going to celebrate that on June 1st and with some special uh, surprises for him and uh, to honor his uh, legacy, not only as our dad, but as one of the last surviving members of the Marine 2-5 who fought at the Chosen Reservoir. So that's what the book is about overall. It's, and each chapter kind of illustrates aspects of masculinity. Uh, Alan, you just mentioned the whole story about Kane, where they found the Roman soldier with the guy's nose in his teeth. I mean, he fought right to the end, buried in the mud. Uh, and that's typical of all the men uh, in this book. There are no women in this book. So just to not disappoint the ladies, you don't figure in this book at all. Uh, women were not, with, except with very rare exceptions. Uh, the Crusades was one of them and uh, the Russians in World War II were not part of any kind of combat units up until the present time. Uh, so it's each, each chapter reinforces the notion of what it means to be a man <clears throat> in terms of physicality and in terms of what are you defending? What are you fighting for? Uh, the answer turned out to be you're fighting for the guy next to you. In, in abstract, you're fighting for your country and duty, or, duty and honor and all that stuff. Uh, closer to home, you're fighting for your wives and your children and your family and your, your, uh, your tribe. Uh, but when it, when it hits the fan, you're fighting for the guy next to you, and he's fighting for you. And that's why <clears throat> the bond between soldiers is so tight uh, in the field, and it has to be. Uh, and anything that disrupts that bond, such as sex, uh, is, I believe, and so do most uh, military historians, antithetical to the proper functioning of a combat unit. So while I'm not opposed to seeing women uh, in the Army or the Marines or any place else, uh, the field of combat is not the place for them. And if that's a regressive, toxic attitude, I'll just have to live with it. There you go. Now, um, speaking of re regressive attitudes, the the Immanuel Kant uh, statement of the natural state of man is war. In, in our day right now, everybody seems, at least in this, in this country, or maybe in a sort of Western civilization, they have this idea of perpetual peace that is going on, despite the fact that we've been at, at war for, what, the past 20 years, um, and we've been in different conflicts uh, across the globe. But there is this idea of, you know, we've now reached the point where we've got peace, um, so now our natural state is peace, and we have sort of taken this, I guess, almost a Hegelian uh, evolutionary step towards leaving the past behind and now we are better than what was before us. How do you sort of convince people, no, 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 just because we've, you know, thousands of years have passed, we haven't changed as mankind. Human nature is still the same. It is still like the natural state of man is war. Yeah, well, I think history shows that. And you guys are sons of history, students of history. The Romans are no different than we are, really. I've been spending a lot of time with the Roman writers and Roman history. Uh, what those soldiers fought for and what motivated them is very similar to what motivates us now. And I don't think we've actually been in a state of peace. I was born in 1949, and I went to college in 1967. The Vietnam War had already started at that point. So in my lifetime, we've been at war essentially since I was about 10. And here it is 60 years later, and we're still fighting wars that we don't want to win. I think that's the biggest difference now is that it's somehow rude to use overwhelming force uh, on an opponent to put him down. And yet this has been the mantra of the most successful generals throughout history. I just was reading Andrew Roberts' biography of Napoleon, and Napoleon says something that Sherman echoes half a century later, which is the most merciful kind of war is to get it over with. Yeah. Kill as many of them as you can until they stop fighting and now you'll have peace. And that will come a lot faster if you don't restrain yourself. So, you know, the, the, then you wander into war crimes and all kinds of subsets, but the objective of war, it has to be total victory. Um, Ulysses Grant was called unconditional surrender in part because he actually used that word, those words, uh, and in part because that was his warrior ethos. Um, He's certainly the one of the two or three greatest generals in American history. And when Lincoln gave him 
the assignment to bring him out from the army from the western front effectively in tennessee and back to washington uh he just wanted to win and at that point he didn't care very much how he did it and so grant said yes sir and then uh if you follow grant's campaign once he gets to washington you see it's it's an ex inexorable meat grinder uh, of a fight he understood as early as shiloh and i have a chapter in last stands on shiloh uh that this was not this war wasn't going to be over in five minutes that the confederates were dug in they were they were good fighters uh, they were outnumbered but they had you know, sort of a esprit de corps that the Yankee army lacked uh, for much of the war. And he was going to have to fight them to the end and they were going to have to be destroyed. So Grant knows this right away. And after Lincoln has wasted his time with uh, all these uh, parade ground generals and guys that didn't want to fight, I mean, Meade only won at Gettysburg by accident in a way because he wasn't even looking for a fight. He wasn't trying to engage Lee's army in any meaningful sense. They just bumped into each other. Uh, but once Grant takes the reins, uh, the South is doomed, and he rolls up uh, uh, Lee in a textbook fashion. It's it's a it's a good example of masculine win willpower. Uh, Lee uh, Grant just won't take no for an answer, and he gets beat. And he gets beat bad. Cold Harbor, he says in his memoirs, was the the worst thing he ever did. He just regretted that uh, effectively. 18th century attack uh, in a 19th century war. Uh, but once past that, uh, he and his generals, including Sherman and uh, Sheridan, and George Arm Armstrong Custer, who's the subject of another chapter in Last Hands, uh, they roll him up pretty good. And in fact, uh, Custer, who I have a great sort of sneaking admiration for, it's the longest chapter in the book by far. Uh, Custer was the, <laughs> was the first Union general to whom the South surrendered. So Custer is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. He's at Appomattox. He's in the picture of Grant Lee signing the armistice. Uh, as I said, he received the, the surrender of some Confederate units be, even before Lee showed up to, to sign the articles. And uh, then of course he goes out West and makes himself into a either notorious or heroic figure, depending on which period of American history you're discussing Custer in. So, uh, the idea was to mirror these guys from the earliest Greeks, from Leonidas to my own father, uh, and what motivated them and how they did it. And we tend to look at them and say, well, that was brave or that was this. Uh, none of them ever says, boy, was I brave when I did that. You know, maybe crazy, but not brave. They, they say, as my dad did to me in the last chapter of Last Stands, we went to work. I said, how'd you feel when... 100,000 Chinese came running down the hill at you screaming and firing off rockets. And he said, well, we went to work and that's it. Uh, and a point I've made <clears throat> a lot in discussing this book is, again, goes back to the Romans. If you follow your training and you maintain discipline, you have a chance to survive even something as, as bad as Kane or the Chosen Reservoir. Uh, if you don't, if you panic, if you break the line, you'll definitely get killed. So uh, that's what happened to the Romans at the Teutoburg Forest. They got ambushed, almost American Indian style, by the German barbarians. And their lines broke, and they tried to run. The equestrians, who were the noblemen, i.e. people that could afford a horse, uh, they, they, got, they tried to get away. They were hunted down, and their heads wound up nailed to trees all over the Teutoburg Forest. And uh, years later, uh, when the Romans came back to kind of pick up the pieces, they found the skulls of their companions literally nailed to trees. Uh, you can't panic, you can't run, and you have to stay cool. If you break your cool, you'll lose. And that's all there is to it, really. You know, I speaking of not losing your cool, it does seem to me, like what you said, since the the end of World War II, America in particular, has had this hesitance to finish off a war, to do what is actually necessary to finish a war. Um, and as you said, Grant says, like, that's the, that's the kindest thing that you can do, um, is to finish it quickly. Or Sherman yeah. repeated Napoleon saying that. Yeah. And it seems to me that, that we have put in this um, tenderness to something, this most singular thing in existence, war, that requires no tenderness, really, when it comes to combat. Um, and we are 
sort of reaping those, not rewards, those uh, repercussions from it, from, um, you know, having a, a draw more or less at Korea. Um, you know, Vietnam, you more or less just, you, you left, um, you know, because you've been there for so long. Uh, you have, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan. Afghanistan, you're, you're there for 20 years. And, you know, uh, we have, you know, the Afghanistan papers that come out and, you know, Mattis is saying, you know, well, we've given, you know, women's rights and different things like that. It's like, that's not why, well, why are we there? And I think to an extent, we've sort of lost this idea or the vision of what actual war is. And it is cruel. It's the opposite of what Stephen Crane says. Uh, it is cruel and it needs to be done quickly. Yeah, well, it's just not being done quickly. And I think that's part of the ongoing uh, uh, undermining of uh, the American character uh, and the feminizing of it. There's something uh, online right now. There's a Russian uh, training video, recruitment video for special forces guys. Uh, and then you compare that with something our army just put up, which is a, a, a woman, I think she might be a lesbian. She had lesbian parents. She's joined the army. She's found a community in the, I mean, who cares for God's sake? That's not what this is about. Right. Uh, and, you know, I got a lot of comments on my Facebook page and people saying, I'd pay to see that fight between the Russians and, and our feminized armies. But of course you wouldn't because it would be cruel and it would be a slaughter. I, I partly blame Hollywood for this because for many years now and ever more so uh, as women take over the movie business, they wanna show women as being effect effectively really hot men that uh, a 95 pound girl can kick a 235 pound guy through a door, literally with one kick. Right. Uh, this is a, a fantasy on the lines of Wonder Woman, you know, or Wakanda or, or some kind of magic place that's hidden by a, a, a shroud and nobody knows they're there, and, but it's actually a race of super beings. I mean, this is comic book stuff, which one of the criticisms I have of young men today is they should have put that stuff behind them when they were 12, like the rest of us did. But to continue to make superhero movies and these how, how popular so-called graphic novels, which are basically comic books, uh, are as opposed to real literature and real fiction, uh, history-based fiction, like the Iliad, for example, uh, it's sad and, it, and I think it weakens us and I think it's weakening us on purpose, uh, which will get us into the devil, devil's pleasure palace here in a minute, but it's not good. And it, I don't wanna see women killed in combat because they think, well, I punched him and he didn't fall down. I want her to remember what that Roman did that even though he, he knew he wasn't going to make it, he ripped the guy's face off with his teeth. Yeah. That's something that is just not going to be imbued into our warriors. And then you look at those Russian boys, holy cow, they look like they go out and whip Hitler again all over it and come back for lunch. So yeah. uh, this is a stark, stark division now in our societies. And if you don't think the Russians are laughing their heads off at us, then you got another think coming. And now for a quick word from our sponsor. All right, everyone, we've got Patriot Knife Coffee. They are sponsoring the show. And we've got this. What did you think about this last week? I liked it because most of your coffee has been bland and nasty. But yeah. I didn't want to say anything because uh -huh. it was free. Well, this is such a, a huge plus for us because you don't use up all of my creamer. Now, to did douse the taste that I had in my old coffee. This is Texas bourbon pecan. This is absolutely delicious coffee. So go order your coffee now at PatriotKnifeCoffee.com. And now back to the show. That's the scary thing to me is that this idea of, you know, let's be all inclusive. Let's lower the standards. Let's let everybody into the military. And it's just like, guess what? Our enemies aren't doing that. They're not falling for that. We're doing that because we live here in America and nobody comes to our shores, right? right? But it's not always going to be that way. And no one else, Russia, China, uh, Middle Eastern countries, they're not falling for that. They're not doing that. And it's, it is going to be a major detriment uh, to this country if we continue in that way. What did you well, want to say? Well, I was going to say, I saw, the Russian, I saw that Russian military ad. And uh, I also saw one for the Chinese military. And then... And then I go and I see the CIA, they had this woman that 
described herself as cis something or other, and and uh, and I and I'm I'm thinking, okay, if our enemies see this, they're gonna look at us as these weaklings. And you and I, we had a discussion, and I know you get tired of hearing it, but I'm gonna bring it up anyway because we're talking about it. But I was always a Walking Dead fan, and I was always a Star Wars fan. Mm -hmm. And the Walking Dead, all the strong men mostly are killed off except for Daryl. And now the women are the ones that are kicking butt. And if you look at the Star Wars, I think it was episode 8, where all the, the officers, all the ones who were in control, and somebody pointed this out, if you look at it, every single person in the, in the headquarters was a woman. Uh, running things and you know and I'm it, you know look I know women are good snipers I've seen women shooting and they're when when they're when they hit the target when and their precision works I mean you can't beat them but in terms of physical fighting there's an I, obvious, I just, I just, an obvious it, difference. yeah it's yeah. just you know and, and, and then look at the Kavanaugh look at the Kavanaugh hearings who was the big hero Dr. Dr. Ford I think was her name yeah and she shows up she shows up with a very weak voice and she's portrayed as the hero. And it's like, if you look at what you're saying, Hollywood, versus what we're seeing in real life, there is a, there is a stark difference. And, and one last thing I wanted to add was, on the news, there was about how uh, Hollywood or, or, or maybe social media, the reporters are trying to weaken us. Well, right now, what's going on in Israel, there was a reporter complaining that Israel is this really mighty, powerful country, and the, the Hamas and the Palestinian Authority in Gaza is not. So why are they using overwhelming force? Yeah, it's not proportional. Right, it's not it's proportional. Like, they need to be a little bit more... Come on, man. They're, you could eat them, beat them in one day. Why are you bombing them? Yeah. yeah, well, I hope the Israelis don't pay any attention to that. And also, Israel, if they wanted to, could put a stop to this permanently. So it, it might be time for the Israelis to stop uh, take the gloves off and, and deal with Hamas uh, and Hezbollah and the other people that are tormenting them uh, in a definitive sort of way. Uh, but it gets back to this whole notion of proportionality and it's somehow rude to defeat your enemy. You have to make him feel good about losing. And, and too many people in American society want to win at the bargaining table. Well, guess what? The Korean War is still at the bargaining table, literally. There's no peace treaty that's signed there. It's just an armistice and it's been going on since the, what, early mid fifties. And here we are in 2021. Uh, this is just a way for diplomats to have permanent occupations, I think, but it's not a way for countries and certainly not great powers to uh, comport themselves. Uh, and, and I think Israel's a good example because it's being just rocketed to pieces right now. Uh, amazing how things change uh, with an administration change, isn't it guys? That's just stunning. Uh, what are the Israelis supposed to do? And their own government is so bollocked up. Uh, Netanyahu is still, I guess, the prime minister, but still in the way uh, he hasn't formed a government yet. I, Israeli politics is too complicated for this Irish boy to understand, although Irish politics are no, no <laughs> joke either. Um, but uh, you got to fight to win. And if you don't fight to win, you're going to lose. That's it's a, It's a simple stark uh what's the word i'm looking for binary choice win lose uh, this perpetual negotiation isn't going to happen let's put it this way the end of the napoleonic era uh came about after prolonged fighting so we're, we're talking uh 10 12 15 years from napoleon rising as a general under the directory which was still the french revolutionary government and to his final defeat at Waterloo, uh, Europe massed against him two or three times, not just once. Uh, Britain and Russia and Austria and uh, Italy was just too split up to actually have a coherent fighting force. Uh, but in the end, they finally, and he put himself in a position where they could finally destroy him. And they did. And so that's why he wound up out on the island of St. Helena, which is down in the southern hemisphere off the coast of Africa, uh, where he spent the rest of his of his life, but they had to have the will to beat Napoleon. And uh, as you move forward to the Congress of Vienna and Metternich and all those people, you see that the first rule was destroy Napoleon. They didn't like him because initially they didn't like the French revolutionary government. It was after all a regicide and the crowned heads of Europe were made very uncomfortable by that. 
Uh, and then once Napoleon crowned himself emperor and went on the offensive against them, they knew they had to stop him. So uh, Wellington beats him at Waterloo, as we know, but uh, it was without the Prussians, he, he wouldn't have. Right. And th that was a, 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 a coalition dedicated to the absolute destruction of Napoleon. And then you had peace in Europe for a while, not that long. I mean, the French and the Prussians went at it again in the in 1870s. Uh, and then you have World War I in 1914. Uh, and then you have World War II, the sequel, uh, starting in 39, but with the rise of Hitler in 33. Uh, let's see, then I was born. And then we had the Korean War immediately. <laughs> and then we had Vietnam. And uh, as everyone talks about Vietnam, it's interesting because to the baby boomer generations, uh, because there's a great uh, attitude now. Why didn't you serve? You're such a tough guy. Why didn't you serve? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, and of course, if you weren't there, you don't really know the history. But uh, and it seems very politically incorrect today to say that when you were a young man uh, of draft age, i.e. 18, and I was already in college before I well before I was 18. So uh, I had that uh, deferment because I wasn't eligible for the draft, but when you were eligible for the draft, if you were a college student, uh, you were given a four-year exemption from the draft. And that wasn't because of racism or sexism or God knows what other isms they've come up with. It was that the country had decided that the, and most guys didn't go to college. This is another thing. It wasn't a universal thing like high school or kindergarten today. It was a very small percentage of men or anybody that went to college. So they wanted those people to survive and they wanted those people to go into government and be the future leaders of the country. They were very unabashed about this because I say it sounds very elitist now, but uh, that's the way it was. And so we were all deferred until the it was 1969, I think. Uh, they got rid of all the college deferments and they put us all in the lottery. They instituted the lottery. And so for the first year of the lottery, I was between my junior, sophomore and junior years, junior, see, I forget. Um, you went into this bucket and then it was televised. It was like little uh, pop-up, uh, little balls would pop out of a, a chute and then they'd read off your birthday. So of course we were all very interested in this TV show. And depending on where your birthday fell was the order in which you would be drafted. You would be drafted. There was no more deferment. Uh, so. Uh, I was 201 and they didn't call my number. So that's how and why I didn't go into the service. I was still in college at that point. Uh, but, you know, those are the old days and it's changed now and the military is all volunteer, which I don't think is a good idea, particularly. Uh, and it's become more of a career and social advancement. And now under wokeism, it's become basically the diversity mania that, that is uh, hurting the country in, in, in so many different ways. Uh, but we have lost our mil militaristic tradition. And uh, another thing about that was that tradition had stayed alive in the South. Once the South was beat, those boys became American patriots and the armed forces were heavily, heavily Southern uh, in makeup. Uh, the Northern boys didn't, didn't join up the way the Southern boys did. So we have all these social forces over the last 50, 60, 70 years going on. And now, and again, in today's woke climate, we've got a funny modern way of looking at the past and blaming the past for what we perceive as the sins of today. It's, it's complicated, but at essence, war isn't that complicated. It's who's the bigger guy and who's got the better weapons. That's the guy that wins. So you get to get back to your book real quick. You institute the Chosen Reservoir, the, cho the, the Frozen Chosen. This is one of the most um, brutal moments in American military history, uh, not just because you're completely surrounded, but also because it's around 40 below zero. Um, you're near the Yalu River. And all of a sudden the Chinese come through. Your father fought in that battle, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And so did this sort of personalize this book in a way that hadn't been personalized with any of your other works? Uh, only, oh, uh, well, there's two answers to that. Only at the end, because <clears throat> I wasn't sure where I was going to use his story. 
Uh, and since I had opened with a very short preface about my own family's history, I ended with it. Uh, so clearly that's an homage to him. But I, I've written my novel and all the saints, uh, which won the 2004 American Book Award for fiction, was the first person is the first person autobiography, so to speak, of a famous Irish gangster named Oni Madden, who, uh, among other things, Cotton Club and was the number one beer brewer in Manhattan and produced Mae West shows on Broadway. He he was the the image of the Cagney, well-dressed, good-looking gangster. Uh, and I dedicated that book to not only my dad, but his dad and his dad. So I, I, there were three generations, generations of Walsh's, uh, one of whom was born in Ireland, where I live today, part-time, uh, on the spot where my great-grandmother was born, in fact. Uh, and the other were the other male ancestors. So I, I think his uh, spirit has uh, informed a lot of my work. Now, I left home when I was 17 so and never went back. So uh, I had a relatively short exposure to him, especially since he was away, not only in Korea, but in Vietnam as well. But, uh, you know, it's very hard to live with a kind of living legend. And uh, I've tried to do him homage in, in several works. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, and, it, and, and, and it's great that you... You did write about it because I personally have a, a soft spot for the Korean War, um, and and it's one of those things where it's considered the Forgotten War. And I think the more uh, good writing is done about uh, the war, I think the more people will understand uh, how rough of a war it was, but also how important of a war it was, and how many um, firsts were involved in that in that war. Uh, back to your book, Honor. We had mentioned. Um, you know, it's it's about masculinity. We mentioned honor and courage. Honor is place in society. Um, I want your views on its existence or non-existence in, in modern American society. Which, masculinity itself? No, honor. Honor, sorry. Uh, well, uh, this gets us into a, a, an essential topic, which is this notion for of diversity. Uh, and the push for it at the expense of everything else. And a diverse society, as we know from history, uh, is, a, is a low trust society. That is not everybody is sharing the same ethnic, religious, cultural, historical norms. We're just not. And American society has prided itself on that uh, in its formative years when we needed people. Uh, and during the period when we had almost no immigration in order to absorb the immigrants we got from Ireland, including my own family, and uh, the Italians and the Jews from Russia and Central Europe, uh, the Germans themselves after a, a famine in, uh, in the Rhineland in the middle 19th century, uh, we, we did a time out to sort of Americanize those people. Well, now that's considered rude again, they, that uh, uh, people should be able to come here and maintain in effect, their own little duchies and fiefdoms within the United States, but that creates a low trust society. So the concept of honor, which certainly by World War II, uh, we all shared, we all shared the same goals. We had to beat Hitler, uh, although that was in a way less important for the United States than beating Japan. We fought the Japan war pretty much by ourselves. And with uh, the European conflict, we fought it in collaboration with the Soviets and uh, to some extent the British, but they had been knocked out of the war fairly early at Dunkirk and made a comeback. Uh, so I think that honor now is considered, in some cultures, honor is a fool's game. You, you don't wanna be, I mean, God knows I spent enough time in the Soviet Union and in East Germany. I was there between 1985 and 19, 91 when the Soviet Union finally collapsed. Uh, I was at the Berlin Wall when it came down, for example. In fact, I have here in the library across the room here, I have a piece of the Berlin Wall that I personally ch chunked out of the, the wall when it came down. Um, uh, what you found in those societies, because of the disparity between the stated nature of the society and the actual nature of it, that everyone was corrupt on some level. And you could use that to your advantage if you had to. You could bribe people and you could you know, get into places you shouldn't get into and you could work the bureaucracy and you could do a lot of things. But you were always 
effectively breaking the law by doing that. And that's a low trust society. Nobody trusted anybody. And the only thing that, that worked for you was either uh, threats or bribes. Um, and obviously in my case, I wasn't making any threats against anybody, but the, for example, the unit of currency, not too many Americans knew this at the time and don't anymore in the Soviet Union was not the ruble, which was they artificially overpriced it to make you buy them because they needed hard currency, what's called valuta in Russian, uh, was not the ruble, it was not even the dollar. Although they wanted dollars, they didn't want German marks and British pounds, they wanted dollar dollars. But the unit of currency was a pack of Marlboro cigarettes, that's it. So when I first went to Russia, I saw these businessmen buying cartons of cigarettes. And I thought, you know, these Euros smoke more than we do, but wow, that's a lot of cigarettes. Uh, then I quickly found out on the first trip that uh, they used them uh, to buy stuff. So you would hold up, a, if you needed a taxi, for example, Russian taxis were very cheap, you know, because it was the people's taxi, except they weren't worth it to the driver to drive them. So you couldn't get a taxi. This is the genius of socialism, which we're now seeing moving it in our direction. So you'd hold up a pack of Marlboros or fingers. You go one, not one, two, three, as we all learned from uh, uh, Inglorious Bastards, but one, two, three, so you don't look like an American. Uh, and that would meant one pack of Marlboros, two packs of Marlboros, three packs of Marlboros, and then cars would stop. Oh, great, now you got to ride. That's how it worked. It was a very efficient black market system, but of course it was such at odds, so at odds with the government that it collapsed. and. The Russians, it took, what, 70 years, about 70 years, two generations to collapse it. East Germans managed one generation and they were good at it. I mean, the rest of the of Central Europe was not good at it, obviously. So that's what you get when you have a, a corrupt, low trust uh, society. Uh, another example of that in Russia, speaking of diversity, um, the Soviets, the, there, were, there were relatively few Russians in the Soviet Union. It was largely an empire cobbled together of non-ethnic Russians. So Georgians, for example, Stalin, in fact, wasn't Russian, he was Georgian. It's always amusing to me. Hitler wasn't German. Uh, Stalin wasn't Russian. Napoleon wasn't French. Churchill was half American. He had an American mother. Uh, it's, the leaders seem to be the guys not from there. Uh, but you had the Georgians and the Azerbaijanis who were largely Muslims, but some Russians there. You had uh, Armenia, which was a, a long time Christian holdout all the way back to the Roman Empire. Uh, then you had the stands out in uh, southeast uh, part of the Soviet Union, and they all had different customs. And so I was driving in a little Lada, which was the sort of people's car, to something. And the guy that was driving me was taking me to a meeting at somewhere the, right near the Kremlin. And uh, when we parked, he took off the windshield wipers and he locked them in his glove compartment. And I said, why do you do that? He said, because the Cossacks will steal them. So literally every time you parked your car, you took your windshield wipers off because you couldn't trust people not, the Slavs wouldn't take them, but in his view, the Kazakhs would. So that that corrupts a country so so viciously. And I hate to see our country moving in, in that direction because then honor's out the window. No one has any, only a fool has honor. When one person doesn't, only a fool has honor. Well, I know I've uh, noticed the discussions by many people that we are a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multicultural country, and they are the first ones that they just don't care about our past. They don't care about George Washington. I mean, I'm seeing this everywhere I go, and um, you know, I mean, it's what are we going to fight for if if somebody does fight us? Who? Well, that's that's our primary concern is that um, you will have something worth fighting for, but if people don't think it's worth fighting for, nobody's yeah. going to fight for it and you lose it. Yeah. Well, let's put it this way. Uh, <clears throat> when Hitler attacked his ally, let's not forget that Stalin and Hitler were allies. Good guys. Uh, yeah. Well, there was a low trust society there. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, Stalin did not go. Uh, the, the Russians did the same thing Kutuzov did against Napoleon, which is retreat, 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 retreat. But eventually they knew they were going to have to fight at Leningrad and, and Moscow and Stalingrad, uh, which is where the war was decided. Uh, Stalin didn't say to the Russian people, we're fighting for communism. Oh, no, communism went right out the window. He said, we're fighting for the Rodina and to a certain extent to the, for the Russian Orthodox Church, because 
Moscow uh, historically has been viewed as the third Rome, that the center of Christianity went from Rome to Constantinople and then to Moscow because the Russians adopted the Cyrillic alphabet and many of the Greek uh, trappings. <clears throat> so they were fighting for the motherland all the way through the war. You never heard a word about communism. Mother Russia. Yeah. Yeah. You, you got to increase that trust, right? Yeah. So your book is doing very well. Uh, are you surprised at how well it's doing and, and the response it's, it's getting? Well, I'm very pleased with the response. Uh, you know, you never know when you write a book if it's going to sell or not sell. I mean, I've been lucky that I th this is my 16th. And I think all but one, which was just a little opera quiz book, very specialty thing, uh, have earned out, as we say, which means it makes back the advance and your publisher's happy and you're happy and you get royalty checks, you know, some small, some big uh, from all these things. So that was that made me happy. I, obviously, when we sold out on day one on Amazon at a time when we were in the, the, the lockdown and Amazon was the place that all the books were going to get sold. Uh, that was great, although we it meant we missed the Christmas market because we had no product in the pipeline. And that's been rectified and that won't happen again with the next one. But I think that the fact that it's uh, got an 81 percent five star rate rating on Amazon, that's very unusual. Um, and that's very gratifying as well. And uh, some people hate it. Uh, the people that hate it are all Alamo fans. <laughs> don't, don't, the Texans are mad about the Alamo. You can't say one thing about the Alamo without setting them off. Oh my God, this ruins the entire book. What an idiot. How dare they publish, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> hey, hey, now I will say this. I heard one of your, your interviews, and I'm like, I don't even know if we want to have this guy on the show. Uh, <laughs> as you said, that you weren't a big Texas fan, and we're freaking from I Texas. I know, we're Texans here, Alamo, you know. <laughs> no, well, I don't mean to insult all of Texas, just most of Texas, okay? Um, but 81% five stars is great, and... Uh, mm -hmm. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, moving on from the regrettable incident at the Alamo. Uh, it... It, it's being bought by women, uh, which is very encouraging. And they're writing to me and saying, I bought this for me. Uh, a lot of them come to it via the audio book, which I did myself. Uh, the audio, uh, your audio, your, 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 fan, your female fans like the audio books and they like to hear the authors read them. So well, it's very difficult and it's hard and it's exhausting, but it, it's worth it. But then they say, then I went back and I bought the book for my husband, my son, my dad, my brothers. So uh, it's kind of like Star Wars. I mean, you, you don't go just once, you see it 25,000 times, right? So you want, you want that, and that's what makes a book uh, a, a, a strong bestseller is multiple people buying it and giving it uh, as presents. And so I hope the, the Rage to Live, Time to Die, sounds like a Bond movie, I know. Uh, I hope that has a similar success, and I, I think the audience will be ready for it, and they're looking forward from the letters that I get, they're looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it, although not to the writing of it, because that's that's very physically taxing and hard. And uh, I have to prepare, steal myself, as they say, to go back up into the combat zone with that one. There you go. I was looking at uh, the back of your book, and the one, the two words that caught my attention were toxic masculinity. And uh, I, my, when I, I was like, oh, man, I got to read this, uh, this, this review, Merrill Gordon. And I was afraid, oh, my, you know, that maybe is this about something uh, uh, that's woke but uh, but apparently she she said some good things about you and... well Meryl, Meryl Gordon is a great writer I've known her for 50 years we were colleagues uh, as young reporters together uh, she's a very close personal friend but she's a liberal and yet she's a liberal that uh, I maintained with her and her husband a, a very warm personal friendship and I asked her I said Meryl would you blurb my book and she says I you know what it's you. I, so she did. And, and, I, and I wanted someone to say that because you don't want just all of your friends saying nice things about you. I mean, I, I've never met Caleb Carr. I correspond with him a lot, but Caleb is a great, great writer, as you guys know. And he gave me an absolutely wonderful blurb. And Victor Hansen, I, uh, I was on a cruise to Hawaii for Hillsdale College with Victor. And I said, I showed him the proposal that had been accepted. I hadn't written the book yet. And I said, you know, I'm not really trying to work your side of the street here, but I'm fascinated by the idea of a last stand because there were no books, literally, as far as I could see, about last stands. And so it was just a kind of like finding a $500 bill on the sidewalk. 
Uh, and Victor was great and read it and gave a very uh, important blurb, which is on the cover. So that was all terribly helpful. But, but uh, to, to, to your point, Alan, I wanted somebody who would not be sympathetic to that particular point of view and have her react. And she did. And I'm very grateful to her. Well, it just, you know, I have, it occurred to me, has uh, have there been a Marlboro man lately? I haven't seen anything. And this, I know this kind of, the whole masculinity there is, just there's disappeared. A, there's a new, there's a, it's a Marlboro woman, but man, she's haggard. Well, I saw like, that. She's got missing teeth. <laughs> well, she's, what about, what about the. She is rough. Let me tell you something. That hat is down at all times. I have not yeah. seen that, but I did see the Obama's uh, pajama boy on the cover uh, trying to tout the new website for the um for the uh obamacare oh, you see that you see no. that i mean he's like he's holding up a cup of coffee he's wearing a pajama oh, that no yeah, man that. no man yeah. would ever wear no he was wearing a onesie he was wearing a onesie yeah, yeah. it was a beautiful moment in american history yeah. well there is an attack on masculinity because it's 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 considered anti-female and anti-feminine and my response to this to the third wave feminists is uh if i understand you correctly the highest form of a woman is a man. That's what you want, isn't it? You want that 95 pound girl to kick that big bulky Soviet thug right through the, out the window. Uh, you, you want women to have the same uh, physical appetites as men, the same sexual appetites as men. You want them to compete against men. Uh, you even want to let men be in women's sports and let them break their skulls in the boxing ring as, as one of them did. Uh, what's wrong with you people? I mean, you're really selling out women because they're so embarrassed by what actual traditional, and by traditional, I mean, from the Romans to the present, femininity actually is. And I hope to write a book on that subject someday. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, we could we could definitely go down a rabbit trail. Maybe we'll have you on the yeah. show later on and, and talk about that because I would love to. Um, but let me ask you this, because we talk about the, you know, people saying toxic masculinity, but it seems to me, and, and, and Alan, I, I know it feels the same way, that it's all coming from the top. It's all coming from politics, academia, and celebrity, Hollywood. But right. when you have a, a response to your book like you have had, it seems to me, and maybe you feel the same way, I don't know, let me know, but that American society is saying to hell with these views that are coming from on, the, on top. This is not right. We're going this way. Do you feel like that that's sort of society's view, sort of the, the base level? Yeah, I do, because I don't think you ever meet anybody that believes this stuff. You read it all the time. You, you hear it on uh, national propaganda radio. Oh, excuse me, NPR, national public radio. Uh, okay. You hear it nonstop from them. Uh, clearly, you hear it on the late night talk shows. Uh, I don't watch television, but I understand there are such things. Um, mm -hmm. And you hear it from the Biden administration, of course, and whoever is the puppeteer pulling the, you know, the thing yeah. that makes his mouth move. Uh, you hear it from them. The left is fully invested in this, uh, and and you know that's the whole other subject, obviously. But why are they fully invested in this? Uh, they do have to break up the family, and they have to break men down because men are the only people who will be able to resist this. Uh, women won't. Uh, his, his, this is a terrible thing to say, but historically true. And I'm just a historian here. I just you know, report. Uh, women tend to go with the strong men. I've often used the expression, men are Romans and women are Sabines. And, and that gets back to the abduction of the Sabines in the earliest days of, of Rome, that the women who were abducted by the Roman men who had no women and they needed some and none of their neighbors would lend them any. Uh, eventually, they, when the Sabine men came back, the women said, and, and to fight, the women said, no, we're not going to go with you. We're, we're wives, we're mothers, you know, we've, we've, we've started families. We're, we're, we're Romans now, buddy. You, you lost. So that was the end of the Sabines. The Sabine men eventually came and became Romans because their women submitted to the Romans. And uh, conquerors throughout history have known that and have used that as a weapon against the cultures that they're trying to destroy. Certainly the, uh, the, the Turks who even before they were Islamicized uh, were such feared warriors and, and what they would do to cities that they would capture you know, was pretty gruesome. Uh, and they pushed themselves all the way from Central Asia right to Constantinople. Uh, because of that ethos. So I think that the, the, 
the, the notion that uh, somehow we're going to talk this out or hug this out is just not going to happen. And, and, and we can't be ashamed of our masculine nature. Now, let me emphasize, I don't mean go out and punch somebody in the face. Uh, also, don't be a hero. You don't, in any military unit, you don't want a hero. The guy who thinks he's a hero, you don't want him. But then heroes come. And one of the stories I'm, I'm going to tell in, in uh, A Rage to Live is about, uh, let me just uh, get his name here for a minute. Uh, it, it, it does, I don't have it at the tip of my tongue, but he was a, a young dentist from Milwaukee who had been uh, drafted and put into an army mash unit. And his position was overrun. And you know, this is a guy who's not a warrior at all. He picked up a rifle. He fired at the Japanese overrunning his tent. He bayoneted a few of them. He saw machine gun guys go down. He grabbed the machine gun and he was found dead with 93 Japanese corpses piled up around him. Now, this, this guy, nice Jewish boy from Milwaukee, did not join the army to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. But this man is such a hero because he, 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 he stood up and he did what he had to do because that's what the circumstance, he didn't run. He got as many of the wounded to safety as he could. And he died at his position. He's got the Medal of Honor, of course. And it's just a, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. And those are the heroes. Audie Murphy, you know, was what? He was 17. I think he even lied about his age to get into the army. And this guy was just a one-man wrecking crew against the, the Nazis and the, and the Germans. So uh, heroes arise uh, on the field of battle. You, you don't want the guy that's going to get himself killed and all of you killed because he thinks he's a big shot. That's for sure. Yeah, I think John, was it John Brazelon, was that his name, in, on Guadalcanal? The, he won the Medal of Honor. Um, yeah, he was he was he, running back and forth, and he got yeah, you know, he, killed. He, but yeah, right he rose to the occasion. Yeah, and, they uh, all do. They all do. And, and all the Medal of Honor winners who, who are not posthumous winners, obviously, or, or alive, they'll say, I wasn't a hero. You should have seen the guys that died. You know, yeah. I'm the lucky guy here. So that's, I think, the real masculine spirit, certainly the spirit I grew up with, and uh, I think more of our young men need to have, be proud of who they are. Everybody gets to be proud of who they are except us, which is weird. So yeah, anyway, this is a little call to action. Well, I remember uh, in, uh, was it Richard Winters, uh, VZ Company stated that uh, his grandson, I think, asked him, or it might have been Mike Rennie, one of, his, uh, one of the men with him, asked him, were you a hero daddy or granddaddy? And he goes, no, but I served with a company of heroes. Yes, yeah. So, um, and then, you know, opposite, I look at the TV show MASH as being one of the ones that started um, the, yeah, the, the, mask, the feminine, feminization of men because any man who was strong was, they were, he was ridiculed. But if you look at Alan Alda's character, I mean, he was, he was a weakling, but... Well, Alan Alda went on to play that same character throughout his... I mean, we used to joke about the Alan Alda types in the 70s when that man was considered weak and feminized and various other epithets I won't repeat for now but uh, but he took over he's the guy he's the guy that's running the world right now not not John Wayne and that and the the uh, anti-war movement really was the one that started demonizing masculinity in a in a major way and and here we are now with no with no wins to speak of and our our not just our boys, but our girls too are getting killed for nothing in Afghanistan. That that war should have been over two weeks after it started, and uh, it's a sad commentary on the state of the country. So I'm trying to, in my own small way, uh, bring attention to what these traditional virtues, and of course, virtue is a word from veer, from masculine. It's the Latin. Its root of itself is maleness. Uh, virtues and verities actually are and hope that we can rekindle some of the spirit in the younger generation. So last question, Michael. Um, this book is called Last Stands. And these are chock full of lessons of courage, honor, discipline, um, and understanding who you are as a man. Are you also trying to give a another or just give the lesson of this could be America's last stand if we don't to an extent revert back to the virtues of these stories well it came out right at the time of the you know the Trump the after the election and 
Trump trying to fight the election results. And so there was very much of a last stand whiff in the air, which I think uh, helped help the book's success. I should mention uh, before we go that uh, one of the criticisms of the book on Amazon has been, I thought I was going to get a whole detailed thing about the battles themselves. And I didn't think I was going to get, well, what you get is why did this happen? Who were the people in it? Uh, how did it come to pass? How did the battle unfold? What happened afterwards? Why do we still talk about it? Was it celebrated in story and song? I mean, two of the chapters are poems. One of them is the Song of Roland, which is the French national epic. And one of them is the Siege of Siget, which is the Hungarian national epic. And so I use the poetry in order to show the kinetic nature of the battle. So you get much, it's much more than a war book and it's even more than a masculine book. It's a, it's a history book of how these things come to be so that when we get to the next one, we're not so totally taken by surprise by it. All right, Michael, thanks so much again for, for joining us. Um, man, what a fantastic conversation. We thoroughly enjoyed it. We hope that you did too. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alan, Dustin. Thank you. When's your, uh, when is your next book uh, coming out? You said 2023, right? Yeah, if I, assuming I start writing it like tomorrow. Yeah, it's, so it's it takes a while, but we're planning publication around Father's Day, twenty twenty three. Beautiful, perfect time. Yeah, well, we de we definitely need that. I'll I'll tell you that. But based on the way our society is going, I mean, just with some of the conversations I'm yeah. having, I, I'm like, am I the only man here? <laughs> well, when you're in a room full of women, yeah. Well, no, so. no, no. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to get yours. Oh, anyways, all right, all right, Michael. We will talk to you later, man. Thank you again. Bro, that was a really fun interview. Did you have a good time? I had a really good time. I I, I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I've spoken to him on the phone before, but mm -hmm. uh, that was a that was a very fun conversation. Yeah, so. absolutely. And we hope that you enjoyed it as well. And speaking of um, book and movie recommendation, yeah, shall and, we? Yeah, let's do it. Let's um, make it obvious. The yeah. book recommendation. Yeah, I think we're is both what we've gonna, been talking about. Yeah, I think we're both going to recommend the book, mm -hmm. uh, The Last Stands. Yeah, Last Stands. I actually started on it um, just uh, what, Saturday night. Did you? Uh, actually, no, Friday night. Started on it. I'm like, man, this is a book that you're not going to be able to put down. I yeah. guarantee you. Yeah, I, I I noticed some of the battles that he put on there. The the Zulus. The uh, um, you know the Song of Roland. I don't know. A lot of people don't know that, but that was a that was a huge medieval uh, bestseller. Hmm. You know, Charlemagne during Charlemagne's time. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, was it a New York Times bestseller? I don't think so because I don't think New York was around at the time. Now, Old York in England was around when the Song Old of Roland. Old York Times. York. York. They, you know, that was a town city that was sacked by William Wallace only in the movie. I don't think he really sacked. York, but yeah. uh, yeah, so yeah. I wouldn't mind sacking a town sometime. Well, but you're gonna yeah, need people, yeah, who can do it, yeah, who are up for it, yeah. up for the challenge, yeah. But yeah, Thermopylae, the Battle of Thermopylae, you know, the 300. So, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, famous battles in there, but yeah, that that's going to be my my uh, book recommendation now. Movie recommendation, which is also in this book, this is one of my favorite battles. Um, it's the uh, Battle at Rourke's Drift. It was between the small, um, I don't know if it was a battalion, you know, but uh, definitely bigger than a company, but a uh, small group of uh, British soldiers that were like right on the border of Zululand and Natal in South Africa. And the Zulus approached and surrounded, and it was a two day battle. There's a, um, you know, the movie uh, stars Michael Caine. I think it was his first starring role. Mm. And uh, another guy whose name I can't remember, he played Achilles in another movie. And he was also in the Guns of Navarone, but uh, he was known as the Butcher of Barcelona. But uh, yeah, that guy, those two guys uh, star in this movie. It's a really good movie. I, it came out, I think, in 63. Um, but yeah, it's called Zulu and uh, very much worth watching. Yeah, definitely. All right. My movie recommendation is They Will Not Grow Old. This is, uh, this came out, what, I want to say Definitely. 19, right? When? 18 or 19? Uh, yeah, 19, I think so. I think There's more so, in there. Yeah. Yeah. Peter Jackson, uh, this was his project. It was about, it's a World War I documentary. And it's, you know, if you look at the old black and white footage, everything's like super fast. Mm -hmm. And in black and white, well, he, he added color, slowed everything down, added sound. Yeah. And it is, act it is incredibly impressive. And ladies and gentlemen, if you've never watched this, it is quite an experience. Uh, so truly, watch yeah. that. It's kind of sad knowing that every guy you see on there is is uh, has passed because there are no no more survivors left uh, from the First World War. So, 
But you know, you know what I also noticed? Hmm. There aren't any survivors from the Civil War either, and that like I have a hard time going to sleep thinking about that. Well, no, that hurts me. It's just that the last survivor from the First World War just recently passed, like in the last ten years. So that was the last major war. I mean, in about maybe twenty years, uh, all the World War Two soldiers will pass. No, this is within twenty years, I should say. Yeah, it's kind of you know. Yeah. Very sad. Oh, and speaking of World War II veterans, we've got our official trailer up, our official trailer of our upcoming documentary on a World War II veteran who actually passed away this past April, April 19th, sadly mm-hmm. enough. Um, so anyways, all right, Alan, that's the end of the show. Where can people find us? Well, they can find us on uh, Facebook, on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, and then we're also on Instagram. You have your you have your shows on Instagram. No, I don't. You don't? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. You moved it to YouTube. There I you go. Okay, well, there you go. Because we we're doing the streaming. Uh-huh, but we're still yeah. on Instagram. We're still on Instagram. But you know, you know um, I'm gonna be. Oh, by the way, we we also have our very own website www.thesonsofhistory.com. Mm-hmm. And coming up, I'm going to be traveling to Georgia, uh, Florida, and Alabama, and I'm gonna go on location. Uh, now, the Georgia one, that'll be on location of some of uh, the Revolutionary War battles uh, fought between the Loyalists, the Patriots, British, some Americans, um, you know, Battle of Augusta, that kind of thing. But but when we go to Pensacola and Mobile, that's where Bernardo de Galvez, um, you know, had his uh, Gulf Coast campaign, which greatly aided, when Spain greatly aided the United States in the Revolutionary War. There you go. All so right. we're going to we're gonna interview Mike Bunn and Wesley Odom. Bunn B. Sure. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. We will talk to you later. Have a great oh, wait, week. Don't forget the scripture. I know. You gonna have a? You don't have a scripture? Oh my. Okay. Jesus wept. Yeah. That that's a scripture. Ooh, I got one. What? Greater love hath no man than a man who lays down his life for his friends. I like that even better. Perfect. All right, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. We will talk to you later.